We are finishing up a series called Broken, and we're look, over the last several weeks we've been looking at how the gospel addresses um, our guilt, how the gospel addresses our shame, and how the gospel, this morning we're going to be looking at how the gospel addresses our fear. We've been seeing, thinking that the gospel, sharing the gospel, how we share the gospel across cultures. We've seen that in Genesis 3. There are three primary results or consequences of sin. There's guilt, there's fear, there's shame. And the gospel hits on all three of these. Over the last few times together, we talked about guilt and shame. We talked about how although these different effects of sin are prevalent all over in all cultures, there are many cultures where one kind rises over the other. We talked about how here in the Western culture, we're consumed with this idea of being right or wrong, of guilty or innocent. The most comfortable place for us is if I'm okay and you're okay. We don't want to be wrong. We don't want to be found wrong on anything. We live along this kind of guilt and innocence paradigm. And yet there are parts of the world where what you say is determined to be honorable or dishonorable based on not whether it's right or wrong, but whether it brings honor or shame to your family, honor or shame to your tribe, or what it does to bring honor to the people around you. They live in a paradigm of honor and shame. We looked at that last week. Guilt is often based on something you've done, but shame can be some, based on something that's done to you or where you're born. Maybe it's a social class that you're born in. Guilt and shame are part of a lot of cultures, and yet there are also a lot of people in the world who live more along the lines of fear and power. That's their paradigm, fear and power. Many Latin American cultures, African cultures, even many Asian cultures are more based on fear and power instead of guilt and innocence. And there's a constant struggle with the supernatural, with different gods or ancestors or spirits, or with a constant fear of what the supernatural might do. I saw a lot of this in South Africa where even Christian churches would still have ancestral worship as part of their service. Cultures where belief in the supernatural is very real. They don't know the enlightenment rationalism that has taught us that the supernatural things don't happen anymore. Instead, they see spirits and gods and even ancestors and ghosts at work all around them. They work, these spirits will work through innate objects like rocks or trees or um, hills. Everything that happens in your life is attributed to the work of a god or a spirit. If the crops fail, then it's obviously the gods were not happy. If things aren't going right in my life, it's because I've done something wrong. If I'm sick, I need to appease the gods or because it's God is judging me and the gods are angry and I can appease him by certain rites or rituals or things that I can do. So there are many cultures in the world that where they participate in certain rituals at certain times of the year so they can appease their gods, where they can turn to their gods when they need help. And you and I might call that superstition, but it's very real in many cultures. And as a result, anyone who has the power with the gods has power in that culture. This is why in these particular cultures, whether they're called priests or shamans or witch doctors, there are people who have a very firm hold on the people in their culture because they're the ones that have power. They're the ones who have sway with the gods that they can go to to have peace or power with the gods. And so in light of that, how does the gospel not just address our fear, not just address our guilt, and not just address our shame, but how does it address our fear? And that may seem foreign to us, but let's be honest. We all have some struggle with fear, don't we? Maybe fear is not just limited to other cultures. Maybe there's a sense of fear that's, that is the nature of all of our lives. Even in our own culture, there are a little research on various different phobias. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds of diagnosed phobias that we struggle with, fears. You might recognize some of these. If you recognize them, calm out. Arachnophobia, what is that? Fear? Spiders. Aerophobia? Huh? Flying. Claustrophobia, you guys know that. Space. Dentophobia. Dentist. <laughs> Ecclesiophobia. Theologians. Church. Church. <laughs> Glossophobia. <laughs> Lip gloss. <laughs> nice. Speaking in public. Glossophobia. Paternophobia. 
Fear being tickled by feathers. <laughs> Hamartophobia. Theologians. Fear of sinning. Pentarophobia. Any of you know what that, what that is? Pentarophobia. Fear of your mother-in-law. <laughs> Some of you just figured out what your fear was. There's a name for it. All right. Luposlophobia. Lupos, luposlophobia. This is the fear of being pursued by timber wolves around a kitchen table while wearing socks on a freshly waxed floor. That's what that is. So just in case you're not, you think that you're not afraid of anything, there's something out there to be afraid of. Fear is all across our culture. And how does the gospel address our fear? How does the gospel speak to our fear? We're going to use the same pattern we used the last several weeks. We're going to look at one verse, and then we're going to catapult into four stories from the life of Jesus. And the goal is, as a result of these stories, that we'll not only know our story and how to address fear in our lives, but we'll at least know how at least one story when we can share the gospel with people that live in fear. So we'll be able to share God's story with them in whatever culture we find ourselves in. So if you have your Bibles, 1 John 4 is where we're going to be. I want to you to hear what John says about fear. 1 John 4. We'll start in verse 16, go down to verse 19. It says, So we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment, because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but Perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. I want to focus on verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The word that John is using there is phobia. It's where, we, it's where we get that word phobia that we just described all those words with. Basically, all throughout Scripture, there are good kinds of fear and there's bad kinds of fear. There's a good kind of fear in fearing God, being in awe of God, loving God, revering God. But we also see a bad kind of fear, a dread. And that's what John is getting at in our text. In fact, in verse 18, the, the original language, fear, is actually the first word. It literally says, fear is not in love. What he's talking about is how many people who profess to be followers of Jesus, who profess that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, and yet they live and they struggle with fear. They're afraid of even the smallest things. They're more worried about what could happen to them instead of trusting in Jesus. He basically says two things here. First of all, he says that love is incompatible with fear. Love and fear cannot coexist. If you have love, fear cannot be there. They're incompatible. Second, love is invincible against fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Whenever you have love, it's invincible against fear. When love comes on the stage, fear is gone. And when we think about fear, there's a real tendency, even for us in this room, to think, well, I don't have bad fear of God, but maybe I'm afraid of that person, or maybe I'm afraid of that thing, or maybe I'm afraid of this situation, or maybe I'm afraid if I do something wrong, the devil is going to sneak into my family and destroy us. But Overall, fear is really not that big of a problem. But what I want you to see is that how fear and the love of God go together because if we really believe that the God of the universe loves us completely, if we really believe that God absolutely loves us, then we have no reason to fear whatever person or situation or fear anything that can happen in our lives. You see how fear and love come together? Fear is cast out by perfect love. And I want us to see this illustrated in the Gospel of Mark. Go with me all the way to Mark 4. We're going to be in Mark 4 and Mark 5. And we're going to look at four stories this morning. Four stories are back to back to back. And we're going to see a picture that goes from Mark 4 all the way to Mark 8. But we're going to see Jesus' ten miracles that Jesus does in a row. And Mark gives us these string of ten miracles and they're separated here and there, but mainly it's just miracle after miracle after miracle. And we're going to look at Mark 4 and Mark 5, and we're going to see four miracles consecutively listed one after another. There's this mounting sense of excitement that's happening. If you're a fan of baseball, this is like 
four guys coming up and doing back to back to back to back home runs, right? It's just one right after another, and the fans are going crazy. It's amazing. It's this kind of a picture we have here. We've got back to back to back home runs by Jesus, and they're mounts up one after another, and they lead to the fourth, which is the ultimate picture of why we should not fear. And what I want us to see in every one of these pictures is the power of Jesus being displayed in four different ways. Then I want us to see a characteristic or an attribute of Jesus that kind of rises to the top in each of these stories. And then based on that attribute or power, we're going to see how his love casts out fear with a promise from Jesus as well. So the first story, Mark 4, 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, he rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified, and they asked each other, who is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. Get the scene? Jesus takes his disciples, and they follow him into a storm. Don't miss that. The disciples were being obedient to Jesus and it led them directly into a storm. They get into the storm, the winds, the waves are all around them. The word there, it's verse 37 talks about a squall. That word literally can be referred to like a hurricane-like storm. It's a major storm on the Sea of Galilee. They're surrounded by waves and winds coming against the boat. And you've got the wind howling and you've got water splashing on their faces and coming into their boat. And the creator of the world is sleeping on a cushion. It's kind of funny when you look at the Gospels, this is the only time we see Jesus ever sleeping. The only time we see Jesus sleeping in the Gospels is in the middle of a storm. And the guys are thinking, what in the world is he doing? This is their teacher. This is the person who cares about them, who teaches them, who spends all their time with them. And they go with him because he tells them to go. And they wake him up and he basically says, don't you care? We're about to drown. We're about to lose our lives, and here you are sleeping. And so Jesus gets up, he yawns, he stretches, he looks at the winds, he says, be quiet. And immediately, it gets calm. The literal translation of that word is, be muzzled, you're finished. Everything gets really quiet. I want you to see that Jesus has power over nature. Jesus has power over nature. He speaks to the winds and the waves, and they quiet down. Now in verse 40, it says that the disciples were scared. They were terrified. Literally, the word in the original language is, they're cowards. They're going crazy in the middle of the storm, and probably justifiably so. They're going to step further. This is more than just Jesus having power over nature. After he, after he calms the storm in verse 41, it says again the disciples are terrified. But Mark uses a different word here. He doesn't use phobia. This is a kind of a healthy fear, an awe, a wonder. They're terrified. They look at each other. Who is this that even the winds and the waves, they obey him? I want you to see a characteristic of Jesus in this passage, that the presence of Jesus. I want you to see the presence of Jesus in this text. What happens is these guys, when they see Jesus calm the winds and the storms, immediately they don't put yourselves in their feet. They know. They know in the Old Testament there's only one who has the power to calm the winds and the storms. There's only one who has that kind of authority, and that's Yahweh, Jehovah God. Only God can do that. And now they're terrified in verse 41. They say to each other, who is this that even the winds and the waves, they obey him? They're terrified because they realize that right now in front of them, they are standing in front of the God of the universe. This was not just a mere man. This wasn't just a mortal. This was God in the flesh standing in front of them. The whole story is told from the disciples' viewpoint to help us to see the realization where they come to. 
It wasn't just about a great storm that was around. It wasn't about this great problem and them being scared. What scared them the most was they realized that the God of the universe was right there in the boat with them. And that was a huge faith lesson for them because at that moment they began to realize that no matter how heavy the storm, no matter how dangerous the situation, the God of the universe was right there with them in the middle of it. And he wasn't indifferent to them. Sleeping like it didn't matter. He was right there on the boat with them. You know, where we miss in many sermons on this text that I've heard preached, immediately we go into this idea that says, oh, with Jesus, you're not going to face any storms in your life. Or with Jesus, you can trust him because if Jesus is with you, then all the storms will be calm. But I don't think that's what this passage is teaching at all. That's not what Mark was intending to teach in the first century. Remember the context in which Mark was writing. He was writing to a group of believers who were suffering for their faith. They were being persecuted. They were losing disciples, being beheaded and thrown into the Colosseum and dying. They were tempted in the middle of that persecution for these guys to think that God doesn't care about them, that God wasn't with them, that God was indifferent toward them, and that God didn't care about their struggles. And Mark is reminding them that even among the heavy struggles that you were facing, even among the persecution, persecution that surrounds you, even though it could be like storms coming from every side. The God of the universe is not indifferent. He is right there with you. He is present with you. He's present with you. He's teaching them faith. Don't miss this. Faith is not confidence that bad things will not happen. Faith is not confidence that the storm will end tomorrow. Faith is confidence that no matter how heavy the storm is, God is right there with me in the middle of it. Here's where perfect love casts out fear. Jesus has power over nature. We see his presence. He's there with them. And the promise that he gives to these guys and to every one of us who follows Jesus is this, that we're not alone. We're not alone. No matter what you're going through this week, you're not alone. No matter how heavy the storm is, you're not alone. Please don't miss this. Based on this passage, I cannot guarantee you this morning that you will not face trials and tribulations and struggles in this life. I cannot guarantee you that if you're in a storm right now, that it'll be over tomorrow because of your faith in Jesus. I can't guarantee you that, but I can guarantee you this. The same God who spoke to the Sea of Galilee and the winds and the waves obeyed him is the same God who holds every atom of the universe in his hands. He's the same God who calls stars by name. And he's the same Jesus that said, he will be with us from now till the end of the age. He is with us. Don't miss this. The power of God is most clearly displayed, not in keeping us from storms, but getting us through storms. Maybe his power and his presence are not most clearly displayed, not in sheltering us from the storms of life, but in walking with us through every storm that we face. Listen, if that seems callous to you, can I give you a picture of the cross who Christ, when he went to the cross, experienced the ultimate suffering, the ultimate pain so that you and I can experience salvation. He says, I'm not unfamiliar with your suffering. In fact, I'm familiar with it, more familiar than you could ever imagine. When you walk through it, I'm right there with you. You're not alone. Listen, I hope that's encouraging to you in this room. We're walking through storms in your life right now at this point that you are reminded that the God of the universe is with you. He hasn't left you. He's not indifferent to you. He's not busy taking care of some other issue. He's right there with you. He hasn't left you alone. Jesus has power over nature. He is with you. Number two, go over to Mark 5. I'm going to read all the way to verse 20, a longer story. The longest story we're going to read here. I want you to follow along. Get the details here and imagine this. It says, verse 1, they went across the lake to the region of Gernesis, and Jesus gets out of the boat. A man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he often had been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran, and he fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted to the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you will not torture me. 
For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. And the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the men who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And then they began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. And as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he had mercy on you. And so the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Here we got a scene that seems a little out of touch for us, a little unreal for us. Did that really happen? Did that kind of stuff really go on? I want you to remind you that there are cultures in this world where this kind of picture is very real. This picture of the supernatural. Basically what we got in Mark 5, 1 to 20 is Jesus coming face to face with demons. And we see these demons submitting to Jesus. When you see the power of Jesus over demons in this passage, Jesus has power over nature, but he also has power over demons. This is beautiful. I love this particular passage. Even before he casts out the demons, even before Jesus says the words to them, what do we see the demons doing? They come and they submit to Jesus. You saw what they did? They come up, they run to him. They're living in this one guy, a legion of them, thousands of demons living in this one guy. They run up to Jesus and they run up through this guy and they bow down in front of Jesus. Isn't it good to know that even though all the devils, even though all the devil and the demons hate and loathe everything about God, when they come into his presence, they can do nothing but fall on their face in front of Jesus. Isn't that such a great picture? For those of you who are so worried about a demonic attack or the enemy creeping into your life, they fall at the face of Jesus. And who lives inside of you? Jesus. What do we have to fear? So they fall on their face and he says, Jesus, you're the son of the most high God. The title for God throughout the Old Testament, most often used by Gentiles, by other nations, to refer to the greatness of the Almighty God of Israel. He, this guy knows who Jesus is, and then he begins to plead with Jesus not to send him out of the area. He's begging him, Jesus, please do this, or please do that, because he can't do anything. Did you catch that phrase? Jesus gives them permission to go into the pigs. He can't do anything apart from Jesus' permission. Now this whole picture is there before he even casts them out. Their inferiority, Jesus' superiority. Jesus has power over demons. And what I want you to do is take a picture and see how it comes to bear on this one guy's life. Just as we saw the presence of Jesus rise to the top of our first story, I want you to see the peace of Jesus rise to the top in this story. I want you to see the peace of Jesus rise in this man's life it said repeatedly in our story that no one was able to help him. No one. They even tried to chain him up, and that didn't work. No one was able to help him. Put yourself in this guy's shoes. He's lost everything. He's lost all hope of relationships with friends and family. You don't invite this guy over for your Thanksgiving potluck. He's lost all hope of interacting with people that he loves to be around, people that used to love him. He's lost all decency. He's running around with no clothes on in the tombs. 
He's lost all self-control. He's cutting himself. He's hurting himself. He's lost all purpose for living. All peace in his life is gone. No one, it says in verse 3 and verse 4, no one is able to help him. And yet he comes to face to face with Jesus, the Jesus who has power over demons. And you go down to verse 15 and it says they came and the town came and saw this man. And look at this picture. It says they saw a man who had been possessed by a legion of demons sitting there dressed and in the right mind. Jesus can give peace of mind. And it says the crowds, the town was afraid. This guy's entire life has been transformed. Everything has changed by coming face to face with Jesus. It's the exact same parallel we see in the first story. Jesus standing up and telling the storms to be calm. He calms them and brings stillness just by the sound of his voice. He does the exact same thing here. And he does it in this man's life. The rage that was going on inside of him. The storms that were going on inside of him. By the word of Jesus, now there's peace. I want you to see a promise here. That love casts out fear. Jesus is saying, not only are you mine, but you're safe with me. You are safe with me. Follow me here. You're safe with me. Not safe in that you're sheltered from struggle. Not safe in that nothing bad will ever happen to you, but safe in the fact that there is nothing that the adversary can do to you. As a follower of Jesus, there is nothing that the devil can do to you apart from the permission of Jesus in your life. Did you catch that? There is nothing that the enemy can do to you. See, I think we have this tendency to give Satan way more credit than he deserves. Satan is doing this, or if we do this, the demons are going to creep in here, or Satan is going to do that. Don't forget that Satan is on a leash. He is God's puppy. That's what he is. He is nothing more than that. He's got a little bit of a bark, a little bit of a bite. That's all all he has. And even though the Bible calls him the prince of this world, he is not the king of kings. He's not the Lord of lords. Jesus has all authority over him. And as a result, he can say to his children, you and I, there is absolutely nothing that the devil can do to you or me that can take away the inheritance that I have given you in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit. You are completely, absolutely safe. You are safe in me. Jesus' power over nature, Jesus' power over demons. Third story, next home run, verse 21. These are two home runs back to back. They're kind of sandwiched, one story by sandwich in another. So we're going to actually read to the end of the chapter, and we're going to see how one story starts and how another story, and then pick up in the end where the other story is sandwiched in the middle. Verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, A large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come, put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, and yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd, touched his cloak, because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And at once Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, the disciples answered, and yet you asked, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, Your daughter is dead, they said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He didn't let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. 
After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kaum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Two stories, one sandwich in the middle of the other. Let's start with the one that's in the middle. This woman had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, been struggling physically for a long time. The whole crowd was crawling around Jesus. It's a beautiful picture. The language of the New Testament says she thought to herself, the picture is she kept saying to herself over and over, if I could just touch him, if I could just touch him, if I could just touch him, if I could just get near him, if I could just put my hand on him, then I would be healed. And so she does. She comes up, she reaches, she touches him, and then she runs away and she tries to hide from the crowd, but immediately she feels something. She knows she's been healed. She knows that the power of God has gone through her life. And I want you to see that only does Jesus have power over nature, not only does Jesus have power over demons, but Jesus also has power over disease. Jesus has power over disease. Yet we can't stop there, because if we stop there and see that Jesus has power or disease and leave it at that, we'll miss the whole point of the passage. The passage doesn't end with the woman getting healed and running away and Jesus continuing on to Jairus' house. The point of the story is yet to come. Jesus stops immediately and says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, did you see this crowd? Who do you think touched you? You've got a whole crowd of people around you. And he says, no, someone touched me. Somebody was healed. Power went from me. And he calls out, and the woman finally comes and falls at the feet of Jesus, trembling. I want you to put yourself in her shoes. Just as we've seen the presence of Jesus in the storm, and just as we've seen the peace of Jesus with the demon-possessed man, I want you to see the healing of Jesus in this passage. The healing of Jesus. And I want you to see it holistically, because it's deeper than just her physical struggle. Here's a woman who for 12 years has struggled physically with the issue of blood. For 12 years, she's gone to all the doctors, and the doctors have been unable to do anything about it. Mark tells us that. He goes out of his way to tell us that she's gone from one doctor to the next doctor. The doctors could do nothing about it. And so she comes to Jesus. But her problem isn't just physical. If she had this issue for 12 years, Old Testament law said several things about her. First of all, she was unclean because of her sickness. And as a result, she was not permitted to experience worship. The religious life of the Jewish people, she couldn't go to the temple. For 12 years, she couldn't go into a place of worship. She was defiled. And not only that, but because she was defiled and unclean, she couldn't even relate to other people around her. She couldn't touch other people because if she did, they would become unclean. She would defile them. And so here's a woman who's been ostracized from her community, ostracized from religion, ostracized from social life every day of her life for the last 12 years. She goes into this crowd, interacting with all kinds of people, touching all these people, and then being even bold enough to touch Jesus, risking defiling Jesus. She thinks if she can touch him, she can get away as quickly as possible. And yet Jesus stops. He turns around and he says, who touched me? She comes to him and he looks at her and he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. The picture here is more than just a physical healing. It's a word that's used in other places in the New Testament to talk about how we're saved, how we're delivered, how we're made whole. And it's emphasized by what Jesus does next. He says to her, go in peace, shalom. The picture of shalom. Peace in the Old Testament is that of wholeness, of rightness in your relationship with God. Go in peace. You're freed from your suffering. Go in peace. Your relationship with God is now restored. This is more than just healing of an issue of blood. Her whole life is now made whole. And that was the point. 
the point, just like we saw a few weeks ago with the, Jesus forgiving the man's sins when, he, when they put him through the roof and then giving him the ability to walk, his forgiveness of sins was the point of the whole passage. This woman's life, not just experiencing physical healing, but experiencing holistic healing with an interaction with Jesus. Don't miss the picture here that love casts out fear. Here's the creator of the world walking in the middle of a crowd, going to perform another already incredible miracle, which we're about to touch on. And this one woman who's been ostracized by her culture touches his garment, and all of a sudden the creator of the world turns and looks at her and gives her full attention and stoops down and says to her, your faith has healed you. I want you to see that love casts off fear. Jesus' daughter, it's a picture of affection. It's a picture of care. It's a picture of love. And here's the promise of Jesus. I care for you. I care for you. Don't miss that. The beauty of this passage is showing us Christ stopping in the middle of the crowd, turning to this woman who's been ostracized and making her whole. I want you to remind you across this room in a city of thousands and thousands of people that the God of the universe is concerned about you this morning. He cares about you this morning. He will stop for you this morning. He focuses his attention and his compassion and his power and his grace and his mercy on you this morning. Please don't miss that. Not just for the person that's sitting next to you or the person in front of you or the person behind you. He cares for you and desires to make you whole. He desires to give you peace and bring you healing in a way that only He can do. Does that mean healing from a physical sickness? Does that mean healing from my disease? Maybe. Maybe not. But it definitely means healing in the middle of that. It definitely means total and complete salvation, which far supersedes any disease this world might bring us in contact with. He cares for us. He cares for us. Last story. It sets the stage to free you from any fear in your life. You get the other end of the story. That book ends the story of the woman. And you got Jesus going to this man's daughter. This man is desperate. He's a synagogue ruler. Remember, these are the guys that hate Jesus. It's not popular for synagogue rulers or Pharisees or teachers of the law to go to Jesus for help. Jesus was the bad guy. He was the evil one. And yet he goes to Jesus and he says, I need your help. And at the end of the story, we see Jesus going to this girl. He walks in and he says, she's not dead. She's asleep. And everyone laughs at him. This is not Jesus making a mental di medical diagnosis that maybe she's just in a coma. She's dead. But Jesus is saying, her death is just temporary. It's just for a season. He walks in and he says these words, in Aramaic, which, in the language, which is the language that Jesus spoke in, and all of a sudden she rises up and begins to walk around. Jesus has power over nature. He has power over demons. He has power over disease. But Jesus also has power over death. Jesus has power over that. It's in that picture I want you to see not only the presence of Jesus not only the peace of Jesus, not only the healing of Jesus, but I want you to see the hope of Jesus. Look at the interaction between Jesus and this guy, Jairus, who's this desperate. While they're going to his house, they get sidetracked. This woman distracts Jesus. The woman is healed, and all of a sudden, servants come from the home and says, Hey, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Don't bother Jesus anymore. And when everyone else's face goes down, and there's weeping and crying, Jesus looks Jairus in the eyes and he says, don't fear. Just keep on believing. In other words, don't give up. Just keep on believing. Hope. A hope that's real. It's not ignoring the despair of the situation. We know that. Jesus knew the hurt was real for this man to hear that his daughter whom he loved was dead. It's the same picture we see in John 11 when Lazarus dies and Martha and Mary are weeping. John 11, 35, we see Jesus does something. He weeps with them. He weeps. He knows their tears. He knows your tears. He knows your pain. 
He knows the despair that's there. He's not unfamiliar with any of that. And yet at the same time, in the middle of that despair, he gives us real hope. This is not a hope that he gives to Jairus that maybe things will work out one day. Maybe his team will win. Maybe things will work out the way he planned. He hopes, he wishes, he desires. That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope says we have confidence that this will happen. Don't be afraid. You believe. Keep on believing. They walk in. He raises his daughter from the dead. She's not dead. She's asleep. Her death is temporary. I want you to remind you of 1 Corinthians 15 that says... We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, because he has given us victory over death. Here's love that casts out fear. Not only are you not alone, not only are you safe in me, Not only do I care for you, but he says to all of us who would trust in him, you will live forever. You'll live forever. Death is temporary. I'm the resurrection and the life. He says in John 11, he who believes in me, even if he dies, he will still live. One of my favorite preachers is a man by the name of D.L. Moody. Hundreds of years ago, he traveled across the U.S. and Europe preaching And he saw tons of people come to faith in Jesus through his preaching. When he was a young man, he was invited to preach his first funeral sermon. And he began to search the gospel to find one of Jesus' funeral messages, only to discover that Jesus never preached one. He found instead that Jesus broke up every funeral that he attended by raising the dead back to life, every single one of them. When the dead heard his voice, they immediately came Back to life. Isn't that amazing? Every time Jesus tried to preach at a funeral, they rose up and got out of their caskets and went back to living. Jesus is the kind of guy that you want to preach at your funeral, right? I mean, that's what you want. Friends, even though you and I will die, if you're a follower of Jesus, you will live through faith in Jesus. Listen, if he has conquered death, If he has taken the fear of death out of the picture, what else do we have to be afraid of? What else do we have to worry about? What else do we need to fear? What can nature do to us? What can demons do to us? What can disease do to us? Death has been conquered. Death has been defeated. Therefore, you and I have no reason to fear no matter what this world brings to us. Death hits in unexplainable, tragic ways, many times in completely senseless ways. And God has not promised to give us explanations of why it happens, when it happens. But he says, I have conquered death. I have conquered death. This week on Wednesday would have been my brother-in-law's 33rd birthday. He drowned the week before me and my wife got married. One week we were burying him, the next week we were getting married. Came out of nowhere. Came as a complete shock. I want to remind you this morning that drownings don't have the last word. Heart attacks don't have the last word. Cancer doesn't have the last word. AIDS doesn't have the last words. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's doesn't have the last word. Tsunamis and earthquakes and tornadoes don't have the last words. Car accidents don't have the last words. Hurricanes don't have the last word. The one who has power over nature, power over demons, power over disease, all power over death, he has the last word. And he says to those of us who trust in him, you're not alone. You are safe in me. I care for you and you will live forever. Amen. Therefore, my perfect love casts off fear. Therefore, perfect love casts off fear. Fear is not a must. Fear is not something you need to have in your life. You don't need to fear. It's incompatible with being a follower of Jesus. It's incompatible. 
You can't say you're a follower of Jesus and live in fear. They don't mesh. Perfect love. Pass off fear.